You mentioned that you're a Christian because the Bible's true. Mm -hmm. So my question is, did you do the same detective work on the Book of Mormon, the Koran, and then maybe what sets the Bible apart from these other books? Okay, so I'll give you my, my, I didn't tell you this part of my story, but so my dad's not a believer, but he remarried when I was about five, and his second wife uh, is LDS. She became a Mormon after about maybe two or three years of being married. My dad does not think Mormonism is true, but he doesn't care. That, he doesn't think any of it's true. He thinks all of it, though, is useful. So he will go to church with you. And he'll believe in some generalized form of something because it thinks it raises up good people. He would much rather be in a world in which it, there's a Christian foundation that's fictional, but a useful fiction, than in a world in which there's no useful fiction called Christianity. That's his view. So I have six brothers and sisters all raised LDS. Half brothers and sisters. They're my dad's kids with his second wife. So I first started doing this work. My sister, who was in college, my sisters are named after the month in which they were born because we are not creative people. I've told you that already. So I had a first sister. She was born in April. That sounded pretty good, right? My second sister, though, was born in March. That still works. My third sister is November Lynn, okay? She kind of got the wrong month to be born in. I guess it could have been worse. It could have been October. Would that be worse? December? I don't know. It was November. So November is living in our house, and she sees I got a Bible. She's like, ooh. Surprisingly, by coincidence, I get a knock on the door. Mormon missionaries. Thank you, November. So I... You bought a Book of Mormon. As a matter of fact, I bought the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants. They had a thing called the Quad. I bought all of their scripture. I read through all of it before I even read through the Old Testament. Now, the problem is, if you apply that four-part test to the Book of Mormon, it fails pretty quickly. So I'm here to tell you that if you take that approach, it'll do two things. It will guide you toward what's true, but it'll also keep you from what's false. Now, should you, if you're in this room, and you're thinking, ah, man, I could, I can never decide for Jesus, though, if I haven't first examined every other possible theistic worldview. Really? Can you imagine a defense attorney? He's like, yeah, you know what? I, I see you got like 80 pieces of evidence that point to this guy right here who's about six feet tall. He's got brown eyes and brown hair. But have you shown that every other six foot tall brown haired guy is not the killer? You must release him. No, dude, if I made a case, on, I'm not obliged to show that everyone who looks like him, everyone in that category is not the killer. If I've got 40 reasons to show you he is the killer, make a decision based on that. If you've got good reason to believe that Christianity is true, you're not obliged to have to default everything else. But I will tell you this. I talk about this in person of interest. It turns out that every worldview that follows Jesus, every theistic worldview that follows Jesus, incorporates Jesus. He's on the pages of the Quran. If you're an Ahmadi Muslim, he's on the pages of your scripture. If you're a Baha'i, he's on the pages of your scripture. Even the worldviews that precede Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, by the time they got on this side of Jesus, they were like, oh, we like Jesus. Buddhist leaders will describe Jesus as somebody who fits into their Buddhist system. Same is true for Hindus. You can reconstruct the story of Jesus just from the teaching of Buddhist leaders and the teaching of Hindu leaders from the pages of the Quran, of the teaching of Baha'u'llah. You can actually reconstruct the story of Jesus from the non-Christian sources because all of them want a piece of Jesus. And by the way, Buddhism precedes Christianity. So does Hinduism. And Jesus does not make room for them at all. Everyone wants to hat tip Jesus, but Jesus never returns the favor. So if you are interested in, in God, why don't you start with the one that everyone's talking about? Because it's Jesus who is embedded in every other system. He impacts all. Theistic worldviews like no other historical figure. Uh, hey, uh, I'm a religious skeptic. Uh, I appreciate the presentation, though. I did yeah. informative. Uh, yeah. My question is this. Uh, some of the founders of early other religions were also willing to die for what they believed. Muhammad and his followers went to war. Job's mm -hmm. men got tarred and feathered. Jim yeah. Jones and his followers drank poison Kool-Aid. So these people yeah. are also in this position to know whether or not they believed was true. Absolutely. So how do you, how do you 
Okay, so remember, when I say we have a case, it's a cumulative case. Without all four things, I'm not in. You might have any of these other worldviews might pass in one of those four areas. Or I might not have enough information to know what is the bias behind this. But you got to pass in all four areas in order to be considered reliable. So yes, I found not, it's not just that. It's not that there are some worldviews that might not pass in the, like, being willing to die for it, but they might pass in one of the other areas. Or you might not have enough information to know how well they pass or don't pass. But I have to have a pass cumulatively in all four areas. So I always say, hey, if you're thinking, then just do that four-part test on any worldview. See how far it goes. I simply ask the students for their term paper to apply those four areas to any historically grounded theistic system. And they usually pick Islam. They usually pick Mormonism. They pick something that's, the, that's historically grounded so you can test it historically. Not everything is, by the way. Hinduism cannot be examined that way, but some can. And so I ask them to apply that test. And they give me their papers so and they can show you, well, yeah, it, it does. It might pass over here, but it fails in these three areas. So they're out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Go. Hi. Hey. You can pull it out so it's easier. Um, this is a simple, I have one question and if you would allow, I'd follow up with like a statement for argument. I will allow you a very long follow up, sir. Um, this is also a loaded question, so maybe not so simple. Do you think it's important for Christians to know this information, to hear this presentation, to, to know your argument that you're making tonight? Well, morally, it's just more important that they buy my books. So, no. Well, I, is, why is it important? Well, I hear what I think is important. I think what's happening is, right now we're seeing especially, is you would imagine a time when the culture begins to say, you know, it used to be when I was younger, people would say, I don't like Christianity, but I do like Jesus. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think people like what Jesus has to say about the role of men and women, about marriage, about sexuality, about gender identity, about sanctity of life. I think most of the teaching of Jesus right now is under the bus. So what I see happening is, is that really we have to reach not so much non-Christians to teach them what's true about Christianity as we have to reach Christians to teach them what's true about. Like, should you trust that this book is reliable, that I can trust what it tells me? Because there's some hard teaching in Scripture, guys. Remember Jesus when he went up the mountain? He saw the disciples who went up the mountain? Disciples came to him and he sat down and began teaching them, just saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then he says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of all kinds of evil because of me. He doesn't say if. He says when. He says, I'm sorry, that sucks. No, he doesn't. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward here will be great. No, he doesn't say that either. Your reward in heaven will be great. So from the very beginning, this has been like, look, guys, I'm going to teach you some hard things. And if you actually start to believe these things and start to teach these to others, get ready to get kicked because you're going to get abused and it ain't going to feel good. They're going to falsely insult you because of me. And then you're going to have to start thinking about the reward is not here. The reward will be there. So just hang on. It's going to happen there the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then he says, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt stops being salty, it's good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Look, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill is not supposed to be hidden. No one writes a lamp and places it under a basket, but on a lampstand, it gives light to the whole house. He's saying, this is going to be hard. But if you don't hang, you will no longer be salt or light. So I think it's just important for us to be able to say, hey, are those words even true? 
Should we trust they're reliable? Look, I never talk about politics. I don't care about politics. They're so far downstream from two essential issues. Is the Bible true? And should we take it seriously? If it's true, we will agree on some of these issues. But here's what happens. We say, oh, yeah, the Bible is true, except that I'll take that verse out of context and I'll twist it a little bit over here. And now I got this thing I like and I'll take this verse out of context. Okay, we got to stop doing that. We're not taking the Bible seriously. So I think to the extent that we are talking about, is the Bible true and should we take it seriously? I think it's important. I've recently started distinguishing between, well, after learning, distinguishing between Protestantism and Eastern tradition, yeah. Christianity, like Catholicism and uh, Orthodoxy. Um, the empirical pursuit of evidence and fact-checking, all of that is what it's it's at least one aspect of this Protestant Western worldview that I'm very unattracted to. Sure. Because the more that I learn about religion, you can you can go really far with the the arguments for God and the Bible specifically. Um but it doesn't take you all the way there. That's not oh, the end goal to right. to understand Yeah, you're right. Every in and out of the Bible and where it comes from. It's not gonna do what a good spiritual life is supposed to do for you. I, I agree with you. Um, let me let me answer that question. Then you th then we'll pass up. Then you can come back and ask again. I'll just make sure Brias gets a chance. Okay. So let me answer that question first. Then you can always come back in after this question. Okay, and ask again. So let me just say that as far as uh, you can know all of this data, I'm teaching you. You could know all of this data, and this is only going to give you belief that that is not belief in. That's just belief that. So I can give you all this data. The demons believe that Jesus is who he said he is. They're not saved. They're not in Christ because they have believed that but not belief in. There's a difference between these two things. All of this stuff I just taught you tonight is going to bring you to belief that. That's it. We haven't even talked about the gospel. We've been talking about the gospels. Let me give you the difference. Um, I talked about this in the book. A guy is uh, involved in an officer-involved shooting. He comes out. Uh, he stops this guy in a car. Guy's drunk. He walks up on the car. He gets the guy out of the car. He smells he's got alcohol. He says, mm, this guy looks a little dicey. I want to pat him down before I do the FST, which is a field sobriety test. So he says, do me a favor. Turn around away from me. I'm going to do a pat-down search. Dude's got a gun in his waistband. He does not want him doing a pat-down search. So he turns away from the officer, turns back toward the officer. He's pointing the gun at the officer's chest. The officer is just too far away to do a takeaway move, okay? He's like stuck. I'm doing the officer involved shooting afterwards, so clearly he's going to survive because he's telling me the story, okay? But he says, I'm standing there. The guy's pointing a gun at me. I'm like, I don't know, what do I do? So he says, you know, I've seen this best in the range. We shoot bullets at it. I know it can stop bullets. So I'm just going to tense up my stomach muscles and take the first couple of rounds while I get my gun out. In that moment, he moved from belief that to belief in. Seriously. For me, I knew that all this data just knocked down the barriers that I had built between myself and the, and the Bible. Can't trust it, can't trust it, can't trust it. But if you're going to read the Bible to discover what it says about Jesus, the best you'll probably do is believe that. But once you start reading the scripture to see what it says about you, now you'll begin to turn that corner. Because once I realized that my spiritual condition was actually being recorded on the pages of scripture, and now I trust it because I already knew I could trust it for Jesus, so why wouldn't I trust it for me? So now I'm reading Romans and 1 Corinthians, and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is me. This has been me all along. I never would have believed that before. I never would have even got to Romans before. I wouldn't have cared before. I needed to go through all of this just so I would pay attention to that. And that's what changed everything for me. So it is a matter of, you know, this is all data, and data is not going to get you there. But I will say this to you also. Jesus, if you have regard for Jesus, was a consummate evidentialist. That was the way. 
He says it in the Gospel of John. If you don't believe what I'm saying to you, at least believe on the evidence of these miracles. That word in the Greek is for evidence. He spends 40 days, Acts chapter 1, giving many convincing proofs. It's the Greek word for evidence to the disciples after the resurrection, which is itself a proof. He says to Thomas, blessed are those who don't have to stick their hand in my chest to know this is true. Keep reading because they're going to believe your eyewitness testimony of this direct evidence. Who does he select as apostles? Eyewitnesses. Who gets to write scripture? Eyewitnesses. Who are the first and foremost leading Christians in the early movement? Apologists. This is the nature of this. This is it's a very much John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus. He wants to know Jesus, are you the one? He's in custody. He wants to know, are you, really? Let me tell you what I told these guys. Here's what I would have said. John, my cousin just sent you to ask me that stupid question. John, the, the, who left in the womb when we first met, the guy who baptized me, who sent all of his disciples to me, the one he called the Lamb of God, now he's got doubts? Tell him to suck it up. Start praying about it. No, he does three miracles in front of John's disciples. Go back and tell John what you just saw. That is an evidentialist. So I wrote a book on this called Forensic Faith, by the way. Another book plug, but go ahead. Thank you for coming in, TFC. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Five more questions or five more minutes? Oh, dang it. Okay. Okay. 